actually worked at the Fountain Bakery for the past 42 years and retired a couple weeks ago. He invented the chocolate chess pie, apparently. Um, he wants to be an engineer one day because he loves math and solving problems and wants to go to LSC to accomplish his dream. And you know, he loves hanging out with his friends and just going to see movies on the weekend. And so, you know, when I take a step back, I can look and just be like, we're not that different from each other, you know? And after having that great conversation of getting to know each other, it's just really awesome to see that he's comfortable around me and I can be comfortable around him when you break down those barriers. And now I know, I, I know what to teach him now. Like, if I'm gonna make him read a book, I'm not gonna make him read something about, I don't know, something technology. He wants to read about sports, because he loves sports, which is something he just completely smoked, smoked me in, because I had I had no idea of anything about sports. Um, so yeah, he was just a really great kid. Uh, second, we need to understand and recognize the cultural differences that can cause misinterpretation of the classroom. This can be seen through how we question students, how we establish authority, veiled commands, reading problems, eye contact, and how kids ask for help. So one, the dangers of the veiled command. So growing up, how many of you, it would be like, time to go to bed, and your mom would be like, isn't it time for you to go to bed? That's what happened to me a lot. I'm sure it didn't happen to some of you. If you were in a white household, it would probably happen to you. And this is what is called a veiled command, where the command was in the question. You knew what she meant. She wasn't giving you the option. Maybe you want to go to bed or maybe you don't want to go to bed. You knew that meant it was time for bed. Well, in black homes and working homes, they don't do this. They give direct commands like, go take your bath, go to bed, go clean your room. And so a misinterpretation can happen in the classroom if you're asking your students, shouldn't we all be more quiet? Black students, working class students, they don't see this as a command. They see this as a choice. Um, because that's what they grew up in. So that's something we just like need to avoid in our classrooms altogether. Just be direct, state what you want the student to do, and they will do it. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Um, the second thing that can just be misinterpreted is how you establish authority. Uh, a middle class mindset is that the teacher is authoritative because she is the teacher, but a working class mindset has the mindset that the authority is the teacher because she is author authoritative. So the difference in this is that, you know, I come up here teaching a class, the middle class are like, okay, she's a teacher, we need to respect her. While the working class, they think she needs to gain my respect. And so you gain their respect by controlling the class through exhibition of personal power, establishing meaningful relationships that demand students' respect, display a belief that students can learn, and establishing a standard of achievement that pushes students to help meet that standard. Another uh, uh, way we can misinterpret is in our questioning styles. Um, Shirley Bryce Heath discovered that students do not respond as much to questions that are purely for feedback. So if you're asking a student, like, what is an iambic pentameter, and you just sit there and wait for someone to answer, no one's going to answer because they already know you know the answer. Or if you say, uh, a way to reframe that question is saying something like, why do you think Shakespeare uses iambic pentameter in the way he writes? You know, and that causes them to think, you're like, huh, why does he? And you know, the answer would be something along the lines of it just sounds like everyday speech. Um, uh, another problem that is pretty big is the problem with uh, teaching reading. Uh, so there is no evidence that having a different dialect prevents or hinders a child from learning how to read. But there are theories that say a teacher's assessment of competence is influenced by the dialect children speak, so they automatically make low expectations and teach less. Another theory is that some teachers confuse reading, with, confuse teaching reading with teaching a new dialect form. So uh, one of the problems we see is we confuse correcting grammar with correcting a dialect. So like, if a, if a student says, here go a table, we are much more likely to correct them and say, no, here is the table, even though here go is the same, has the same meaning as here is to the dialect of black students. Um, and then there's, but then you'll get grammatical problems that are like, here's the dog and there is the dog. And that is a grammatical thing that people don't really fix that much. Like, I didn't even know that was a grammar error until I made this presentation. <laughs> um, and then something we need to stop is correcting the pronunciation of students because it can just be frustrating if they're trying to talk and we're just sitting here like, no, that's wrong. What do you mean? You don't say brother, say brother. Um, another thing we need to not do is interrupt the fluency of students reading to correct them because if you do that, it just jolts their mind.
mind and they'd stop. And that goes against the Common Core Standard RF 5.4, <laughs> which uh, says that the flu that children need to be fluent in their reading. Uh, and then the last one is to make sure the students know reading is a meaning-making process. Like when we sit there and we, you know, someone's reading a sentence and you keep stopping them and you keep saying, no, that's not how you say it, it doesn't become something, it doesn't have meaning anymore. It just becomes, I need to pronounce this right, I need to say this right. And that goes against the standard of uh, having to make meaning out of what you're doing. Um, a really great example of the frustration in learning to speak a new dialect was done by Robert Burden. In his college classroom, he made a new dialect. It was kind of similar to Pig Latin, and he had his students uh, speak it to each other. And um, uh, they just, you know, quickly lost confidence. They're like, what is the point of this? Like, this makes no sense, and they didn't see the point of learning this dialect. And it just came to the point one of his students was so frustrated, he started to cry, because like, he couldn't understand it. And, and like, this is in a college classroom. Like, you, you couldn't do it. Like, and just think what we're doing to like elementary students, high school students. So this exercise shows that the pronunciation of something shouldn't matter as long as what is being said is understood, because it's a meaning-making process, not a pronunciation process. Um, another really important thing is eye contact. So like, say I'm conducting class and I look at Jill and I'm like, hey Jill, tell me all about your day. And then you start telling me about your day and I just kind of look down and start writing down some things and looking around, taking a roll while she's talking to me. <laughs> well, she's quickly going to lose confidence because obviously I don't really care about what she has to say, or I might care, but she can't tell I care. Um, so a big thing you need to do is just keep eye contact because it reassures them you're listening. My high school teacher, horrible at eye contact. She would ask something and I would be so happy to give my answer, but once I started talking, she obviously was not listening. And I hated that because it just took away my confidence to want to speak up in class or to think that my ideas were valuable. Um, another one is to notice your working class students. Uh, I read the article, I Need Help Social Class and Children's Help Seeking in El Elementary School, and it shows how much more assertive the middle class is for, is, is for asking help. And while they're a lot more assertive than asking for help, that means that like maybe working class kids kind of fade into the background. And the teacher might assume, well, they're asking for help, so everybody's going to ask for help. And that's a really easy way to become invisible like to those students, because they may not ask for help or have the confidence to ask for help. So you just need to make sure to ask people if they need help. All right, so specific activities in the ELA classroom. One is just like get to know you questions, get to know about their life, because you know learning starts with the student. Uh, greet the students every day and make it personal. You know, look at Kyra, how's your day been? Did you notice anything fun on the way to school? And not only does this make them feel like they're important, but it makes them notice more about the world, especially if you know they know you're going to ask a question to them. Um, translate a rap song into American Standard English. Do role playing, like have a play, and just you know make them read and present to each other. Uh, have a daily news report where they have to give the news for the day, while also um, speaking in American Standard English, like more professional. And uh, all these activities connect to the standard that states students must compare and contra contrast different varieties of English. Uh, for a big activity that you could do, I think this is really fun, it's called the register meal activity. So it's a really great way to teach formal uh, language and home language. So you start off with having the kids have a picnic and they can only speak in their dialect on that picnic. You know, eat the way they want to, do whatever they want. But then you're going to hold a formal dinner where they have to dress up, have a posture, and set up the table really nice, and they have to speak in formal language. And that also goes along with the standard of uh, teaching the, uh, the comparison and contrast of different types of English. So, in conclusion, all of this goes to show that a culture of power does exist in society and in schools. And it's our job as teachers to teach all these students, especially those that are outside of this power. Uh, we need to teach them how to succeed in that culture while also teaching them, and this is really important, we need to teach them that their background is unique and doesn't need to be overshadowed, that this, the code of the culture of power is just merely a way to have success so that they can change it. Like Delphi would say, this culture of power is not ideal for what we wish for, it is simply what it is.